So I was asked about doing a problem, like the problem from chapter 9, number 16. Uh, so I'm going to do a problem like that. Uh, this is a one sample t test. And the way I know it's a t test looking at that problem is the fact that I'm comparing a mean to an expected value and I'm given a sample variance. Okay, if I had a population variance, then it might be a one sample z test because the real difference between a z and t test here is whether or not you know the population variance or population standard deviation. Here we don't, so this is an example. Now the other thing that it's gonna ask us to do is to try to do the test with two different sample sizes, and it's going to ask us to get a variety of calculations, including the effect sizes, not just this inferential test, which would be the T and P value. So here I've written up an example. Mu is that little Greek symbol that looks like a, a kind of an M and a U mixed. So mu again is the population mean or the expected value for your test. Capital M is APA notation for a sample mean. So that's the value you got from your sample you're comparing against the expected. And then the notation here, S caret, which is uh, the notation for exponentiate. Um, so S squared, right, is sample variance. So if I were gonna do a t-test, the one sample t-test looks like this. It is the difference between the observed and expected values divided by the standard error where the standard error is the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n. Um, of course, you could also do the square root of the variance over n, because if I square root a squared value, it just turns into the single form, right? So if I square root s squared, I just get s, which is the standard deviation. So this is how I'm gonna write this here. So if I were to use this, you know, you could do it by hand. I don't ever suggest doing things by hand, do it with a calculator. Um, so if I were gonna, type this out in equation form, the first thing I would have is my observed minus expected value. And then I'm gonna divide this by the standard deviation, which is the square root of nine, which would be three, divided by the square root of my sample size, which for this case would be 25. So this value would calculate a T value for me. So we get a T value and this T value is negative 8.33. Now I can do that exact same process, right? I can take this same type of equation and what I need to do here is I need to change one thing and that one thing is the sample size, right? Now we could do this, you know, if you wanted to by hand or in your head, right? You can do the square root of 25 is five, three divided by five is 0. 0.6 and then you'd get negative five divided by 0. 0.6 and then that comes out to this for the first one. For the second one here, we have, you know, negative five in the numerator, three divided by the square root of 100, that is square root of 100 is 10, three divided by 10 is 0.3, we get negative five over 0.3, uh, but I'm just using Excel here as a calculator, right, to solve that for me rather than doing all the steps, right? <clears throat> so here's the t-test that I get. So these are the t-values that I obtained using this equation. Now, I can get p-values a variety of ways. This asks you to get a two-tailed p-value with compared to an alpha of 0 0.05 or 0 0.05. To get a p-value, you can look it up in the table in your book. You can use the GraphPad online calculator, or you can use Excel directly if you want to. So for example, I can do t.dist.twotailed, and this notice is gonna return a two-tailed student's t-distribution value. Now, one thing about using Excel, it needs a T value and it needs the degrees of freedom, but it doesn't like negative values here when it does a two-tailed test. So if you're doing this two-tailed process, you need to make sure you make this a positive value. So I can do that by using an absolute value function, or you could do that by just typing the positive form of the number. And then once you do that, you get a P value. Now this P value is so small, it's written in scientific notation. I can fix that if I want to by changing it to a number, change the decimal, and I see in fact that it is this very small p-value. So in APA, we would say that's less than 0, 0, 001, right? Now this p-value is gonna be even smaller, but we can use the same process, t.dist.twotailed. We need to get the positive form for the two-tailed test. The degrees of freedom are now 99, and we get an even smaller, this is gonna go way out if we wanna see this in decimal form, so what? There it is. All right, so this is infinitesimally unlikely to happen by chance, given the variability we'd expect in this sampling distribution. So both of these results were what we would call statistically significant, right? We would reject the null hypothesis. Now, if we wanted to do R squared, 
and Cohen's D, we can do those. Cohen's D is simply the difference between the two values divided by the standard deviation. It's a standardized mean difference. So Cohen's D would be negative 5 over 3. Because negative 5 is 15 minus 20 divided by 3, which is the standard deviation, right? So this is Cohen's D. And now if I do that for this case, I still have the same difference and the same standard deviation. So I get the same answer. So Cohen's D doesn't change at all. R squared is T squared over T squared plus DF. So I would take my T value and square it, and I would divide by my T value squared plus my degrees of freedom, 24. And R squared has to be between 0 and 1. 0 means there's no relationship. 1 means that you're, you are accounting for all the variance in, in the difference. So here, this is a very high R squared, right? And that goes along with the fact it's a, it's a very significant value, very uh, significant finding. Now we can do the R squared here, where we would also get the same process, T squared. We divide that by T squared plus DF. And notice here that if I round these, so, you know, if I round these to the second decimal place, R squared is 0.74 for both of them, right? So notice that if you look at the effect sizes, the sample size doesn't really change the effect sizes. But if you look at the T or the inferential tests, notice that the sample size has an enormous difference on the inferential test. Larger sample sizes are make it less likely that you could observe a difference this big and, and believe it's due to chance, right? As you get larger samples, a difference that occurs is more likely to represent a real difference, right? Because you have more evidence to support it, if you will. However, the effect or the size of the relationship doesn't change, only how likely it is that that relationship is due to chance. So if you have a huge effect, but a small sample, then you can't be as confident that it's not a chance thing. You know, if you found two people with extremely high intelligence, that could just be by chance, right? But if you found 100 people that were very different, like in terms of intelligence, you might assume there's something systematic going on, right? You're at a Mensa meeting or something like that if you're talking about super high intelligence, for example. And so this is what this problem is trying to get you to understand. So hopefully that helps you a little bit in the process you might use. Now I will note, <clears throat> with this kind of information, I built a calculator to make this a lot easier for you. And so if you look at this calculator that I made, the t-test help calculator, which is in the files, it's also available to download. You have to log in to your Microsoft 365 account to download it, uh, but I posted it in the lecture slides for the module week. So I could put this information straight in here. So if I have a one sample t-test that I'm doing with a variance of nine and a sample size of 25, I'm doing a two-tailed test with an alpha of 0.05. The mean that I got was 15. The expected value is 20. Notice there's my T obtained that I calculated. There's the P value. There's R squared and D. So notice we did all this work, but my calculator will do that for you if you just know the test you're using. And also I can go in here and quickly change my sample size and everything updates, right? without me having to redo a bunch of math. So I've got some tools out there to help you do these things more efficiently, uh, but you need to know which tool to use when. And I think that's one of the most important things to understand in the world of statistics nowadays. Computers can do the math for us and can do it better, and you've had someone code out programs to do that, that's great, but the computer doesn't know which test to pick. So you have to be able to extract that by looking at, well, what information do I have? And so in this case, a one sample t-test, you know, not just because it's in that chapter, but because it is a case where we're comparing uh, a sample mean to an expected value, and we have the sample variance, not the population variance that is known or given. All right. Hopefully that helps a little bit with these types of problems.